In this chapter, we're going to get more into the structure of insurance companies, and in particular, how they've changed from indemnity insurance companies to managed care. Um, <clears throat> this was a major innovation in the late 80s, early 90s. And as we've been discussing, the total expenditure on healthcare in the United States really began to ramp up rapidly uh, once we created Medicare and Medicaid. And that was, becomes the major concern for the federal government. But it wasn't just Medicare and Medicaid. It was everything. All, all, the, all spending on health care ramped up. And this, is, and this graph, again, this is a graph I've shown you before, but shows, and I just won't show it to you again to remind you of how health care really just took off uh, exponentially in the 70s, right? So in the 60s and 70s. And some of it was, was Medicare. Some of it was the emergence of insurance and the ability of people to pay. And some of it was the technology was getting better and better. And that's the story, you know, that's one of the, the good news story of healthcare that I, we've been telling, you know, since the first lecture is healthcare is so much better today than it was, you know, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, two, and certainly two, I mean, 200 years ago it was a joke. Um, so healthcare is getting better and better, but as it gets better and better, it costs more and more. So managed care emerges as a force in the late 80s, early 90s. So really kind of over here on the graph in response to the rapidly rising costs of healthcare. And, you know, we were in a panic, you know, back here, but I mean, look at this, this is what we're, where we are now. So, um, so Tefra, we talked about last time, Tefra, the inpatient um, prospective payment system was implemented in 1983. That began begins a major innovation, you know, shifting care from the inpatient setting, which is very expensive, to the outpatient setting, which is only expensive as opposed to very expensive. Right? But at the same time, other forces are at work, better and better technology which is also more expensive. Uh, so there are forces working in both directions. On the one hand, forces that are trying to make the, the cost of care cheaper, such as shifting from inpatient to outpatient. But on the other hand, innovation, new drugs, new treatments, all patented, right? Or mostly patented and very costly to develop. Remember we talked in, was it chapter six, about the cost of developing a new drug as being close to a billion dollars. So, you know, this stuff is not cheap. It works though, as opposed to, you know, back in the day when our best answer was got a fever. Well, I guess we'll just bleed you. So let's talk a little bit about the demand for healthcare. All right. So I'm going to do a little bit of very basic economics. So what we're sh what I'm showing you here is a demand curve for doctor's visits. So what we have on the um, y-axis, the vertical axis, is the price of a doctor's visit. And on the x-axis or the horizontal axis is the number of visits that a person might want. So let's imagine, just for a second here, instead of doctor's visits, let's think about, imagine you are in a desert and your car's broken down. So you're in the you know um, Death Valley out there in the Mojave Desert in California. And your car broke down and you have no water. And I drive up and, uh, and pull up next to you and, and you say, oh, thank God you're here. You know, I, I'm, I'm out of water and I'm, I, if I don't get any water soon, I, I might die. And I say, well, as luck has it, I am driving a water truck and I'm willing to sell you, you know, a glass of water. How much would you be willing to pay for a glass of water? And after you get over being offended by the fact that I want to sell it to you, you, how much would you be willing to pay for a glass of water in the Mojave Desert? No one else is nearby. This is your only chance to get water. Well, if you don't get the water, you're going to die. So that first glass of water, you'd be willing to pay a lot of money for it. I mean, you know, if it's the difference between living and dying, you'd pay just about anything. So I say, okay, you know, I see that you're willing to pay that, you know, $1,000 for this glass of water. What if I offer you two glasses of water? 
And you say, well, you know, I'm willing to pay a thousand dollars for the first glass and, you know, that'll keep me alive for a while. So I'll take the, you know, but I, who knows when, when someone will, you know, someone actually nice will show up and maybe help me. Um, so I guess I'd be willing to pay $900 for the second glass. So the first glass would be up here at a thousand. The second glass would be, you know, so now we have one glass and we draw a line down to the, to the X axis where you say, okay, that'd be one. Right. And then two is a little less, right. For two. And then I say, well, three, and you say, okay, well, well, you know, now, I'm now, now, you know, I'm feeling a little safer, but I, so I'd be willing to pay a little less for three, four, five. If I offer you to do a hundred, you'd be like, all right, well, you know, a hundred glasses of water is probably, uh, um, you know, maybe more than I need. Cause you know, hopefully at some point somebody's going to come along and take me out of here. Um, so I'd be willing to pay a lot less for a hundred glasses of water. I might be willing to pay a dollar for the hundredth glass of water, but by God, for the first one, I would be willing to pay a thousand and the second one, 900 and so on. Right. So the idea is you can plot a downward sloping curve based on price and quantity for almost any good. I could, instead of offering you glasses of water, I could be like, well, how much would you be willing to pay for a Mercedes? Well, first Mercedes, you might be willing to pay a lot, it might be worth, you know, $70,000 or whatever they sell for. And I say, well, okay, well, I'll offer you a second Mercedes. And I say, well, you know, I'm not willing to pay seven, you know, seven, one Mercedes was worth 70 to me, but uh, what am I going to do with two Mercedes? I'll be give you, I say, well, how about if I sell it to you for, you know, $40,000 and you might say, okay, I can, you know, have, I'll have my, like during the week Mercedes that I pay 70,000 for, and then I'm gonna have my like bang around Mercedes. I only paid 40,000 for. And if I say, all right, well, if you're willing to pay 70 for the first one and 40 for the second one, how about a third one? Right. So now we're way down here. And you're like, well, what am I, I've already got two Mercedes. What am, I'm, I'm one person. What am I going to do with three cars? I'm like, well, what if I offered it to you for $25,000 and you're like, I'm a rich UNH grad, I can afford that, you know? So then I'll have like my even day Mercedes and my odd day Mercedes and my weekend Mercedes. And I've got three of them, right? And 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 as you can, the point here is like, you're starting to run out of things to do with the Mercedes. I'm like, well, how about a fourth one? You're like, I, at this point, having, you know, three cars is one thing. Having a fourth car now, I don't even have a place to put it. That's actually like a cost to me. So that would be a negative value to me. So that, you know, fourth car would actually, you'd have to actually pay me to take a fourth car because I don't even have the space to keep the fourth car. So eventually a good with enough quantity actually becomes a bad, right? Um, so doctor's visits function the same way. If you're really sick, a doctor might be able to help you. Um, uh, one visit to a doctor might be enough to, you know, relieve your pain, right? So if you have a strep throat, a lot of pain comes with, you know, some some strep throat infections can have a lot of pain. Uh, they can uh, cause high fevers, a lot of discomfort. Um, and you can actually, you know, you can, it, the, the strep infection can jump to your blood and you can become septic and you could die. So uh, one visit to a doctor when you're, when you're with sick with strep is worth a lot. Right. And then, so that, because the doctor could give you antibiotics during the, dur prescribe you antibiotics during the uh, a visit. And then, you know, you start taking the antibiotics and you're going to feel a lot better. Would a, how much would a second visit be worth to you? Well, you know, it's going to be worth a little less, you know, because now you're not in pain, but you might want to still go back because strep infection can get pretty serious. And if, if you've really felt bad, you, you might want to have a second visit. So, you know, that first visit, you might be willing to pay, um, say, 150 for, and the second visit, you might be willing to pay 125 for. And then the third visit, you'd be like, you know, if I'm going to buy three visits, I'd be willing to pay $100 per visit. And then if you're going to have a fourth visit, you'd say, well, I'm willing to pay for four visits. I'd be willing to pay $80 per visit. So if you're going to pay $100 per visit for three visits, your total would be 100 times three or 300. If you're going to pay $80 per visit, your total would be 80 times four or 320. So the way we can think about this without uh, out-of-pocket expense is if you had a demand for three visits at $100 and the doctor and the doctor basically the doctor if you wanted to go to the doctor and the doctor said I charge $100 per visit 
So let's let's assume now that you're dealing with a doctor who doesn't take insurance and he's got uh, a menu on his or, or, or a sign on his door that says doctor's visits, $100 each. So then you look at your demand curve, you pull it out of your pocket, not literally, of course, um, but you measure this in your head and you say, how much, how many visits would I want with a doctor at a cost of $100 per visit? And you say, I would want three visits. Now, if he was, again, if he was offering visits at 80, you might find a, a reason to use them for a fourth visit. But at a cost of $100 per visit, you'd say, I'm willing to pay. I'm willing to, at a cost of 100, I'd like three visits. The total cost being 100 times three is 300. So the area under the price and to the left of the quantity, this, this rectangle represents $300. So hold that in your head, right? So now instead of paying, this gets complicated quick. Um, so let's let's kind of back up for a second. So we have our demand curve. We have our price. The doctor is saying, I, I charge $100 per visit. At $100 per visit, you'd want three visits. So that's what we started with. Now you have insurance. So, and your insurance says, with a, you have a copay of $20. So every time you want to go to see the doctor, you have to pay $20. Now you're also going to pay your premiums to the insurance company. Um, but, but separating, setting that aside, whenever you want to go see a doctor now, it's going to cost you $20. Well, when the price to you was a hundred, you only wanted three visits, but when the price to you is 20, you want six visits, right? Now the doctor is still saying to the, now instead of you paying, you know, the doctor, the hundred dollars, the insurance company is paying the hundred dollars. So now at a price of 20, you have a demand of six as opposed to three visits. So you, you know, facing a cost of 20, you're going to want to use the doctor six times per year. At a cost of a hundred, you'd only want to use them three times a year. Here's the thing. The insurance company now pays $600, $100 per visit times six visits. So their insurance company pays this whole amount. You pay 20 times six or 120. So the full cost of the, of the is 600, but you're paying 120. So insurance is paying 480, 100 minus 20 is 80 times six, right? 80 times six is 480. So you, so the insurance company pays 480, you pay 120, the doctor gets 600. Now here's the thing. If you had to pay the full price of the care, you'd have only gotten, remember, remember you would have only gotten three visits if you had to pay the full price of the care. But when you're only facing a $20 bill, you use the care, you overuse the care. You use it beyond what its value is. It The real value of the visit is $100, but to you, it only costs 20. So you overuse this resource. And there's a the, the, this green triangle here, this kind of swamp green triangle, represents the portion of the, um, of the 600 that is just waste and as a result of you overusing. So the area of this triangle would be, it's 80 high, right? it's 80 high, and then it is three wide. So that's three times 80 uh, is 240, and then half times half base times height. So uh, 240 divided by two is 120. So $120 worth of, of waste comes into the system because you're making decisions based on the price you pay rather than the full price of the care. Now, here's the other piece of this though. Like you're like, wow, I'm only paying 120. No, you're really not. You're paying, you're going to pay the 120 out of pocket. And then the insurance company is going to turn around and charge you the $480 this year in premiums, which will work out to $40 a month. So the insurance in order to, to cover their costs, because the insurance company is not doing this for free, as we've, we've talked about. The insurance company has to make a profit 
so not only, I mean, this, that would be just covering medical loss, right? So it's not only, is it going to be $40 a month? It's going to be 480 uh, plus a profit wedge. So it's really going to be more like five something, right? Um, and then you're going to wind up paying that. So there's even more waste going into the system. So this was kind of uh, the model, you know, this is a, uh, this is a, so this is a problem, right? With insurance. Um, and so, it really becomes uh, a big deal in the 80s as insurance companies have are, are facing huge bills and they're having to ratchet up um, ratchet up their premiums. Uh, patients are getting a, uh, excuse me, consumers of healthcare are getting very upset about how much money they're having to pay. And employers who pay most of the insurance costs in the United States were getting really angry. And they were like, this is ridiculous. We can't keep ratcheting up and ratcheting up costs. And so they, so insurance companies being entrepreneurial businesses said, well, you know, instead of doing indemnity insurance where your patient just goes to the doctor and then the doctor does whatever, we can start managing the patient's care. Right. And what that means is instead of the patient just saying, Hey, my knee hurts, I think I'll go see an orthopedic surgeon and then turning in a bill to, you know, for a thousand dollars for something that could have been done, you know, for, for care that could have been rendered by a family medicine doctor for a hundred dollars and some Motrin managed care says, Hey, we will force the patients to go see their primary care providers first. We won't allow them to go directly to see a specialist. We'll force them to go see their primary care provider first. And then when the primary care provider makes a referral to a specialist, we'll have, we will review that referral and we will determine if that's medically necessary or not. And if, if we determine that it's not medically necessary, we will deny the referral. And so the patient won't be able to go get the specialty care. Now, as you can imagine, Doctors, especially specialists, really didn't like this. Um, but patients really didn't like it either. Uh, mostly because they were used to getting, you know, a lot of a lot of very expensive care for, you know, a modest copay. And they're and really who pays who was paying these bills, the insurance company portion, were their employers. But the problem is the employers were saying, we can't keep doing this, or we're gonna have to cut wages. Um so, so managed care steps in and says, we can, we can fix some of this problem by controlling the way patients consume healthcare. And so managed care becomes the bad guy in a lot of medical dramas in the nineties. And so one of the, the hottest medical drama in the nineties was ER. Uh, it was a Chicago ER and it's sort of like Grey's Anatomy or I don't know, uh, whatever it is you guys watch these days. Uh, uh, and you know, you had George Clooney, right. You had, I uh, forget what this guy's name is, but he, his character on the show was, was Mark Green. And he was the, he was the co-pilot with, uh, uh, in the original, um, Tom Cruise uh, jet movie there. I'm blanking all. I, I'm really bad at all these these stars. My wife always knows the names of everybody, and I I just like I don't know who that person is. And she's like, of course, he's she's here. She's been in like 87 movies that you like or whatever. Anyway, the point being, in in this TV drama that ran for like 10 or 12 years, um, the bad guy was very often an insurance company. So like Dr. Mark Green would be like, come run it. You know, they'd have a, 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 a patient, you know, who was going to have a baby and you could save the baby and the mom if they could just do this one procedure and then enter stage left the insurance company who says, no, you know, uh, Dr. Green, we're not going to pay for that for that care because it's too expensive. So choose either the mother or the baby can live, but not both because it's too expensive, you know, and then there, there ensues all this drama and then somebody swoops in to save the day and the insurance company person is, is kicked out of the ER and all is love and roses again. So I, 
kid you not, like it wasn't quite like that, but it was pretty much like the insurance company wore the black hat, the doctors in the ER wore the white hats. And, you know, you knew who the bad guy was as soon as they started talking about insurance. And it was, but no kidding, people were really upset with managed care companies. And, you know, and to be fair to, to you know, not to our drama, but to the way people felt, probably went too far in terms of controlling and limiting access to care. And that's one of our, you know, one of our big themes is cost quality access. Well, managed care did a really good job of controlling cost, but it did a really crappy job of managing access, right? One way that you can reduce cost is limit access. And that's how, you know, um, that's how a lot of countries with national health systems like Canada and, and Great Britain manage their costs so well is they limit access. Um, and maybe, you know, if we think about access here, what did you really need? You needed three visits. What did you get? Six. Well, maybe you didn't need, you know, 100% more access. Maybe you would have been fine with three, but you took six because it seemed like it was free. Um, okay. So managed care gets very bad reputation in the 90s and early 2000s. And so we start to see kind of a, a pushback against managed care. So let's talk about what, what are we talking about when we talk about managed care? So um, the insurance can be, insurance plans can kind of be put on a continuum from the far left with indemnity insurance, where there's the most choice for a patient and the least integration of that quad model we've been talking about. And we put Medicare A and B here kind of uh, toward that end of the spectrum where Medicare A and B, if you're operating on just traditional Medicare A and B, you can basically go anywhere, see anyone, uh, and they get the Medicare payment. As long as they're willing to take the Medicare payment, you can pretty much go anywhere without it, you know, without having to do a lot of what I call mother may I, like mother may I go see a orthopedic surgeon and, you know, you go to see the you have, if you're in a managed care plan, you typically have to go see your family medicine doctor who says, I agree that the patient needs to go to see an orthopedic surgeon. I therefore recommend to the insurance company that you allow the patient to go see the orthopedic surgeon. And now you're allowed to say, mother, may I go see the orthopedic surgeon? And the insurance company acting as mother says, yes or no, right? With On this end of the spectrum, there's no mother may I's. You just go. You just go and um, the physician, the provider, the hospital is paid uh, standard fees for care. And that's what Medicare A and B, I put them a little bit more to the right because they've got a fixed price that you can't negotiate. So the providers either take Medicare or they leave Medicare. And almost all of them take Medicare because like I said before, they are the average provider now especially the average hospital now runs at about 60% Medicare. Okay. So moving to the right with where we sacrifice uh, choice, right? So, so as we move to the right, we sacrifice choice. We see more integration of the quad model. So there's going to be more negotiation uh, of prices. There's going to be a lot more of the mother may I stuff coming in and insurance companies will try to impose supply side cost control. So let's talk about that. So we hit P PPOs. Um, which I'm going to talk about each of these in detail. Um, but a PPO starts to create a network of providers that you can choose from. You can typically still choose who you want to do, who you want to see pretty easily. You don't have to do, do a lot of mother may I. And usually a lot of PPOs, you don't even have to get a referral. You can just go see an orthopedic surgeon. But the way that they limit on the supply side is they negotiate a network of providers that you have to choose from now. So if you're on pure indemnity insurance, you can go see anybody you want whenever you want. With the PPO, you can go see whoever you, uh, you can go whenever you want. You don't have to necessarily ask permission to go, but now you have to choose from a limited list of providers who are in the network. So this is a preferred provider net, uh, organization or, and they have a per preferred provider network, PPO. 
So what you can see here is we're starting to reduce your choices, still a lot of choice, but we're starting to reduce your choices. And the insurance company is now negotiating with the providers. The way you get to be in the network for the PPO is you agree to take a lower um, reimbursement per visit. So the preferred providers are the ones who are willing to do the care for less. Now, we move to the right and we hit the HMO, health management organizations, and we have a couple of different kinds of health management organizations, and they get progressively stricter in the way that they operate. Um, but And I'll talk to each of these in a minute, so I'm just going to kind of focus on the HMO in general, health man maintenance organization. Here, you are going to have to do the mother may I stuff. You are going to have to see a primary care provider in order to get permission to go to see a specialist. So that's a definite must. Um, but the way that providers get paid in the HMO structure is different. And that's what we'll come back to here. But basically, you're moving from most amount of freedom uh, and least integration of the quad model and frankly, highest costs to far right, where we have lower cost, but a lot less choice and more integration of the quad model. All right. So let's talk about each of these in, in, in specifically. So the indemnity insurance uh, usually involves having a high deductible and high coinsurance, right? So you might have thousands of dollars in deductibles, but there's no gatekeeping function. You're basically, you can basically go see any provider you want whenever you want. There's no network, right? You just go see, you know, do I want to see Dr. Bill over in, you know, over in Summersworth? I can go. Do I want to see Dr. Jane over in, you know, Rochester? I can go. Do I want to see Dr. Jose down in Exeter? I can go. Nobody, you know, nobody's stopping me. Um, and this is fee for service payment. So the provider gets a usual and customary rate from the um, insurance company and the insurance company doesn't negotiate with them. They just, you, you go see the patient, excuse me, you go see the doctor, you get a bill, you submit it to the insurance company and they pay it. So it's real simple, but it is also fairly expensive. This is an expensive option. And it's expensive because they're not limiting your access in any way. So they know you're going to use it more. So what does this look like um, cost-wise? Okay, so under indemnity insurance, so we have here on the y-axis, the total revenue uh, generated, and then the amount of revenue that the physician desires to earn. So this is, this has, so physicians have some in their heads, they have some amount of revenue they want to generate to, in order to generate their income. Right. So you go to see a physician in, in her office. She's going to charge you some amount of money. If, if you're a, and especially if you're an indemnity, uh, if you're covered by an indemnity insurance or fee for service, she's going to charge you some amount of money for the visit. She uses that visit to pay for all, you know, her office rent and her nurse staff and uh, her supplies she's using to see you. And then whatever's left over, she gets as income. So she's got some amount of revenue that she wants to generate. And we're going to call that 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 horizontal line here, right? So in order to generate that amount of revenue, she earns a certain amount of money for every visit that she does. And that's what this green arrow represents. So every time she does an additional visit, she goes to her cash register, she goes cha-ching, all right? And, and so if it's like $100 a visit, so visit one is 100, so that'd be here. Visit two is 200, visit three is 300, and so on and so on up to here to where she's making you know a million dollars a year in revenue. Um, at what would that be 10,000 visits, you know, uh, per year. So she has to, in order to hit that desired revenue, she's going to have to do some number of visits, right? So the incentive for providers under fee for service is to do more, right? Up to whatever her desired revenue is, but even it, you know, but she can always be like, you know what, you know, what was great making $500,000 a year, you know, it'd be even better making $550,000 a year. Well, how is she going to go from $500,000 a year to $550,000 a year? She's going to do more visits. So the incentive under fee for service under all fee for service programs is to do more in order to make more money. Uh, and physicians have a special thing. So there's a uh, let me back up for a second. There's There have been some studies with different industries, but probably the simplest one is to think about taxi drivers. Um, there's some great studies that show that 
taxi drivers. So this is pre Uber. So there's, there were no Ubers at the time. So, so if you wanted to ride someplace and you didn't have a car, you'd call a taxi. So there's studies in New York city that taxi drivers had in their head, how much money they wanted to make each day. So they, as I understand it, they, the typical taxi driver rents the taxi from a taxi company, and then they go out and try to pick up fares and they have to cover the rental and then whatever's whatever's left over, they get to keep. So they have in their heads some amount of money that they want to earn during the course of the day. And every fare they do gives them a little more money and a little more money. And then eventually they hit the desired amount of income. And what the studies have shown is when they hit their desired amount of income, they turn off their light, go turn in their car and go home. What's interesting is on nice days, people are more willing to walk. And so they have to drive around longer. They have to, not that they have to pick up more rides, but they have to drive around longer to find fares, to get people who to agree to drive with them. So they work longer days to earn the same amount of money. So, that, so by the end of the day, on a nice day, they've done the same number of rides and they've hit the same desired revenue, but they did it, they took them, let's say, 10 hours of driving around. But on rainy days, everybody, nobody wants to walk. Everybody wants a cab. And so they were able to earn their desired revenues faster. Not that they were charging more, unlike Uber that charges, you know, uh, what is it called? Um, congestion, congestion pricing, I think is the word they use, where they charge higher rates depending on, on demand, which makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't fit this story. So assuming that they can't, that the taxi driver can't charge you more money when it's raining out, everybody, they're still earning the same amount per, per, per fare, per time they pick somebody up on average, right? Um, they're not charging more per mile. Let's just say that. So the, they, they can, but because so many people want to have a taxi driver, excuse me, a taxi ride, they're able to get all their fares faster. And so what, what the study showed was on good days, they might have to drive around for like 10 hours, but on crappy days when it's raining, they might be able to get, they may be able to hit their desired revenue in four hours and they still turn off their light, turn in their car and go home. They're just like, Hey, it was a good day. I'm done in four hours instead of 10 hours, instead of draw, instead of taking advantage of the fact that everybody wants to ride their taxi and working say eight hours where they can like double their normal income. Most of them quit once they hit their desired revenue or something slightly more than their desired revenue. They don't work the full amount that they would normally work, even though they're able to earn more per hour. So it's an interesting story. And that would be a uh, the interesting thing about doctors, though, is doctors also, it's been shown, have a desired level of income. So they have this desired level of income. And if they're not getting enough uh, enough patients coming in, what they do is, is called inducing demand. Sorry, I keep flipping back and forth here. What they start to do is, is induce demand. So if we see the revenue per unit, so the revenue per visit go down, what they try to do is get patients to come in more often. And here's the thing, like if a doctor t says, hey, I need to see you, you know, in three days, like you had strep throat, I gave you I gave you some penicillin. I want to see you in three days. What are you going to say? No. Uh, you know, the doctor knows that he, he or she needs to see you. So you'll probably go back. Well, now the doctor gets to ring you in for two visits instead of one visit. Um, and the main thing here is that we are ignorant, right? We as patients don't know as much as the doctor. So there's an asymmetry of information, asymmetric information, which we talked about uh, in chapter six, where one side of the one person knows the truth about the situation and the other person doesn't. Now, I'm not saying that doctors do this. Uh, what's the word? I'm not saying that doctors do this illegitimately. What I'm saying, and I think what studies show is, imagine a doctor could go either way, right? They could go either way. Like, I could have them come in in three days, or I could just like have them call me if they're still, if they're not feeling better, which way should I go? Well, if, if I'm, if I'm finding that the, 
the, uh, my reimbursement, if my reimbursement for per visit has gone down and I need more visits in order to hit my target revenue, I might lean to the direction of telling the patient to come back in three days instead of just allowing them to call me if they don't feel better. Right. And that way I, I am more likely to hit my target revenue, even though I'm being paid less. And so the idea here is under fee for service, it's not that doctors are making stuff up out of whole cloth, what they're doing and what they're, and frankly, what they're being pressured to do by the organizations that they work for, because most doctors now are not independent. They work for physician groups that are owned by hospitals. And so the pressure that they get from administration, they will tell you, the pressure they get from administration is to do more, do more, do more. And so, and then they get yelled at if they don't do more, and then they get threatened that they won't get paid if they don't do more. And so when they're presented with a situation where they could go either way, on the one hand, they could make a decision like, hey, just call me in a couple of days if you're not feeling better. On the other hand, I could tell you, make an appointment to come back in three days and see me. If they're getting pressured to generate more, more, visits, then they're going to just say to the patient, go make an appointment and come back and see me in three days. They're not going to say, hey, you know, feel free to call me if, if you don't feel better. Right. And so there's a lot of decisions like that, that a doctor gets to make. And the pressure that they get from the system, including, which is built in large part around the de demand for revenue, that pressure that they get helps shape how they decide what they tell the patient to do or not do. Now, there's a lot going on there. And I'm not saying that doctors are unethical. I'm just saying that they're human, right? We've talked about this, right? If, if men were angels, blah, blah, blah. Doctors are are, are human and they face pressures, uh, uh, you know, to perform. And so when it's a, we could go one way or the other, they're going to lean in the direction that is most beneficial to them. So uh, if so, here's in the situation, if prices are negotiated down by an insurance company, then doctors are motivated to do a higher volume. So just simple math here. If I'm earning $100 per visit and my target revenue is 5,000, then I can get that in 50 visits. But if I negotiate to take, if the insurance company comes in and says, yeah, we're not going to pay 100 anymore. We're going to pay 50. Uh, now, in order to hit that $5,000 in revenue, I've got to do 100 visits, which means I've got to double my visit count. And so- it's really hard to prove that any one physician is inducing demand, but there's plenty of evidence out there that it really does happen, especially in response to changes in reimbursement rates. All right. So we talked, that was kind of framing the world from the indemnity perspective. Now we're going to talk about the preferred provider organization or PPO. So like I said, um, they may use the gatekeeping function, but often do not. The main thing that they do is they create networks. So they recruit a network of providers. This becomes the preferred, per, per, these are the preferred providers. And so the insurance company negotiates a contract with this panel of providers and it, who agree to take lower, lower rates, right? So lower cost per visit to the, to the insurer, to the insurer. And you can have a narrow network when the PPO creates a very narrow number of providers and, and it says, you know, so instead of, instead of building a network of 50 doctors, they, maybe they build a network of 10 doctors and they're able to get even deeper discounts from these 10 doctors. Cause they say that instead of saying, Hey, we've got a thousand patients to the, to the, like, the 50 doctors, they say, we've got a thousand patients and the doctors are like are a thousand patients and there's 50 of us. So that's going to be 20, you know, 20 patients for each of us, you know, well, I'll tell you, I'll give you a small discount, uh, you know, if, if you're going to direct some additional patients to us, but if the insurance company now says, Hey, I've got a thousand patients and I'm going to pick 10 doctors to be in the network, which of you guys wants to be in the network? Now that starts to sound more appealing because instead of getting 20 extra patients, you're likely to get an extra hundred patients. Well, even if you're taking some deep discounts, if you can do a hundred more patients, you can make a lot more money. And so providers who are willing to do that extra work at lower prices are, are can be part of this narrow network. Now, what does this mean for a, a network mean? Well, you're, you're in the network or you're out of the network. If you're, if, if you as a patient 
are using a PPO and you want to go see an orthopedic surgeon, you get a list of orthopedic surgeons that are in the network and then everybody else is out of the network. The PPO will, you'll probably have higher deductibles um, and higher co-pays if you see a provider that's out of the network than a provider that's in the network. So what they try to do is they're like, hey, you can go see anybody you want, but if you go see somebody that's in our network, you can pay a much lower price than if you go to see somebody who's out of the network. So that's the incentive to you as a patient is you pay a lower copay when you go to see an in-network provider as opposed to an out-of-network provider. So they use they use tools like deductibles and coinsurance, copayment and coinsurance kind of uh, copayment is a fixed dollar amount, coinsurance is a percentage. It's the same thing that if you go to an in-network provider, you'll have a lower coinsurance amount. If you go to an out-of-network provider, you'll have a higher coinsurance amount. amount. And so that's how they motivate you to use the in-network providers. And they can put even more restrictions on it. So they can have an open panel plan, which is basically what I said was the, the PPO says to you, you can you you can go to see our our network providers or you can go to see out of network providers. But if you go to see an out of network provider, you're going to pay more. That's an open panel plan. A closed panel plan says the, the PPO says you can go to see the physicians in our network and we'll cover you know, most of that cost. But if you go to see a provider that's out of our network, you are a hundred percent on your own and we're not paying anything. So that's a closed panel plan. Um, not a lot of those, but they are out there. And the more restrict, you know, kind of the general rule here is the more restrictions you agree to, the lower the price, right? So the, that, the farther you move along to that right side of the continuum. Um, now, again, providers who are under a PPO plan are receiving a fee for service payment. So just like under the indemnity plan. So here's our indemnity plan paying a fairly generous generous amount because the premiums are very high. PPO, the provider agrees to take a lower rate of reimbursement. So if this was like uh, $100 per visit to the provider, this might be you know $75 per visit to the provider. So you can see the provider if they're getting 100 if they're getting $75 per visit, they have to see more patients in order to generate the same amount of revenue. So if the provider had a target, you know, a target of revenue of a million dollars, they can do it with fewer visits if they're taking indemnity insurance than they can if they're taking PPO insurance. Uh, um, in patients who are insured by a PPO. So this is the fact that a lot of providers found themselves in in the 80s and 90s was suddenly having to work 20, 30, 40% longer to earn the same amount of money as they used to, right? So they weren't super excited about it. So along come health management organizations. And these have actually been around the first one, uh, first formal one, the, the, the uh, services like this have been around for centuries. But the first formal HMO was Kaiser Kaiser Permanente, and it was a basically what it was. Uh, Kaiser was a shipbuilder in World War II, and as firms were starting to provide health benefits, as uh, work benefits to their employees, Kaiser decided to offer uh, to hire his, you know, their own doctors and nurses and so forth, and then just pay them a, a fixed rate. And they would provide all the care to the employees. This becomes the HMO, where um, where you get all of your care from your HMO. It usually has a lower deductible and lower coinsurance payment uh, coinsurance costs to you as a patient, especially for wellness, because they're highly motivated to keep you well. You know, think about if this was an employer plan, right? What does the employer want? The employer wants you to stay healthy so that you don't take sick, sick days, right? So, so the HMO becomes very much structured around the primary care provider or primary care manager, PCP or PCM. And this, and it's very strict about gatekeeping. So this is very much that mother may I situation where you have to go in to see the uh, primary care provider 
before you can get seen by a specialist. So this is one of the ways that they control costs. Like the PPO, they have they have panels that they negotiate uh, in network and out of network rates for. The the uh, the biggest difference is the way that the providers are paid in an HMO. And in an HMO, the provider receives a fixed payment per member per month for all the covered care, or what we're going to call, we're going to refer to as a covered life. So what this means is if you're a family medicine doctor and you agree to be part of an HMO, you're going to get a fixed payment, let's say $50 a month for every patient that you agree to take on from an HMO. And they're going to pay you $50 a month, whether the patient comes to, doesn't come to see you at all, comes once, comes twice, comes five times, you're getting $50. So if they don't come at all, that's like $50 free in your pocket. If they come once, that's $50 per visit. If they come twice, that's $25 per visit. If they come five times, that's $10 a visit, right? But you're getting $50 regardless of how much they use. So what's your incentive? Well, your incentive is to try to keep them well so that they don't come in five times. So they preferably don't come in at all. And then you just keep pocketing $50 at a time. So in this version, right, the total revenue is completely independent of the number of visits. So you're going to get a fixed amount of revenue, let's say $50 per, per member per month. Um, and you need to, in order to, in order to hit your target revenue, you just have to sign up enough patients so that you get the target revenue you want. So if you want a uh, million dollars per year and you get $50 per member per month, well, that's $600 a year, right? 50 times 12 is $600. And a million divided by, a million divided by 600 means you need to take on 1,667 patients. So if you take on 1,667 patients at $50 a month, then you're going to get your million dollars. And it doesn't matter how many times they come in, you're going to get that million dollars, right? That's really cool. Um, the, the downside is, the more patients that come in, right, you have real cost. Every time a patient comes in, you have real costs. You've got supplies, you've got to pay your nurses to take care of them and so on. So the motivation under an HMO is to keep patients healthy and um, and incentivize wellness. So you're going to, they do, HMOs are really good about making sure you're up to date on the immunizations, making sure you're uh, uh, getting your annual exams, making sure you're getting cancer screenings, all that. Because if you get sick, they basically lose money. So the graph looks the same, right? We have some desired amount of revenue, but instead of a number of visits, you have to generate a number of covered lives. So now at $50 per covered life, I get up here to 1,667 num covered lives. That gives me my, my uh, million dollars in target. So if the provider wants more revenue, they have to add more covered lives, not more visits. More visits actually winds up hurting them because it, it's a cost. All right. So there's some variations on HMOs and, um, uh, uh, and they are the staff model uh, is probably the strictest. Um, this is where the HMO actually hires all the physicians. The physicians are on salary. Uh, and so they, you know, they don't, they don't actually have to worry about the per member per month. They're just getting a, they're just getting a, a, a salary and they don't make more and they don't make less depending on who they see. The group model um, is the HMO con contracts with a multi-specialty physician group. So there's a, so there, now we have two separate entities. We have the HMO that's the insurance company and a multi-specialty group, meaning a group that's got like some primary care, some orthopedics, some cardiologists, so on and so on. And the group agrees to take on that. This is where we have this model, where the group agrees to take on some number of cover covered lives at some per member per month in order to generate their desired revenue. And they're taking on the risk that some of these patients will get sicker or, or less sick. And so they're, the HMO basically writes them a check each month for however many patients they have at the per member per month uh, rate and says, here's your check. Uh, it's all you're getting. Don't call us for any more money. And if you, if you can take care of the patients for less than this, congratulations. And if you have to 
if you find out that these patients are sicker than what we thought, too bad for you. Um, that's a bit harsh and that's not exactly how it works, but that's the, that's the essence of the model, right? So, so the group model, we have a HMO is, a, is separate from the providers. There's a big group of providers that all kind of agree to take on the risk of the, of the patients being sick. The third version is the network model where the HMO, instead of contracting with one group contracts with multiple groups. Um, and typically the contract is with the primary care practice, uh, that receives the capitated payment, and then they have to, um, pay for specialty care out of their, out of, out of, out of that bank that they receive. And again, the incentive is to minimize specialty care utilization. And then finally, the independent practice model, sort of like the group model, um, but the group uh, that the HMO contracts with is a contractual organization made up of multiple independent providers uh, and provider groups. So the so the group is sort of a, a made up virtual organization, sort of a joint venture maybe kind of thing. So kind of to understand this, the strictest, strictest version, the most integrated version is the staff model. The loosest version of this is the is the independent practice model. Um, the As a patient, it's all the same, right? As a patient, it's pretty much all the same from your side. It's just different in terms of how the providers are reimbursed. All right, so a big thing that's happening today in healthcare uh, and is part of the movement towards health reform is value-based contracting. And just to understand this idea, what do you want when you decide I need to go to a doctor? Do you want doctor's visits? Is that what you want? And yes, but that's not what you're after. What you're after is to be healthy, right? It isn't that you, you know, you know what make me happy? More doctor's visits. You know what actually makes me ha uh, makes me happy? Not having more doctor's visits. I don't like going to the doctor. I would much rather do something else. Take a walk in the woods, watch a movie. The like, like one of the last things I want to do is go to get medical care. Right? So val the basic idea of value-based care is we're going to pay you for the thing that patients want, which is to be healthy. We're not going to pay you for the inputs, the visits, the scans, the, the surgeries, and so on. We're going to pay you based on keeping our patients healthy. So that's really when people talk value-based care and value-based contracting, that's what we're really talking about is we're trying to buy the thing that patients actually want, which is to be healthy, not the things that are done to them to make them healthy. So um, value-based contracting is a pretty common hybrid model, especially for PPO contracts. And basically the idea is uh, the the insurance company identifies who's reliant on that network or group. And so we, and, and I've kind of talked about this in a previous, um, in a previous lecture, I think in chapter six, but to basically say, all right, we've got this thousand Dr. Jones. We see that you have a thousand patients of ours that are uh, the insurance company says that are, are, our our clients. They're paying us for insurance. We see that you have a thousand of them. Last year, they spent a total of a million dollars on healthcare. What we'd like to do is contract with you to ensure to to reduce their medical spend. And so you're going to you're going to use some resources to try to figure out how to make that population of a thousand people who are reliant on you healthier, so that they spend less money. And if we can get them, and any if if next year they spend less than a million dollars we will share that savings. So it's called shared savings. Right? Um, so if they spend $900,000 instead of a million dollars, we'll, let's say, we'll, let's say just for simplicity, we'll split that 50, 50 with you. So if they say, if you can get them to spend $900,000 instead of a million dollars, you're going to get a bonus of $50,000. And so this is, but if, if things go bad, then, you know, if they wind up spending $1.1 million, eh, no harm to you. We'll, you know, we'll, we will, we'll be disappointed, but we aren't going to take any money from you. So that's an upside only where if there's a savings, then you get a bonus. But if there's a loss, you don't have to share in the loss. There are also two-sided contracts um, where 
uh, if if there if the spend goes up, you get a penalty. All right. So um, accountable care organizations kind of quickly mentioned this before. These are organizations that can either be an actually integrated system. So like MGB is an ACO, Mass General Brigham. So it's because it's got a whole bunch of different practices. It's got a whole bunch of big hospitals and little hospitals and everything in between. And so they contract with different, different health insurance companies and say, hey, we have, you know, we see that you've got these 50,000 uh, members of your insurance company will contract with you to try to reduce your healthcare spend. And then you share with us any savings, right? So that's, that's an ACO. All right. We kind of hit on this in talking an inpatient side, but you know, we, these are the number of, of hospital consolidations now. So we've talked about how hospitals as the reimbursement to hospitals has gone down, we've seen more and more consolidations of hospitals because they can't function. They have to find ways to streamline costs. So one of the ways that they streamline costs is they consolidate, they become part of a system. And then instead of having an HR person at each hospital, they can have one HR person for the whole system, or they might have three hospitals and two HR people instead of having one at each for three, three HR people. They can fire one of them and have two HR people take care of the whole system. And they do that for HR. They do that for finance. They do it for purchasing. They do it for a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, other than actually seeing the patient, taking care of the patient. And you think about it, like how much do you care how many HR people there are at a hospital, right? That's not value to you. And so this is part of the whole value-based revolution that we're going through. And so what you can see is um, we've seen a steady number of hospital consolidations, especially since Obamacare, because there've been a lot of tightening in ways of reducing the amount of reimbursement to hospitals in part from Obamacare, which came in, uh, took effect in, in 2014. What does this mean? Well, it, it means their hospitals are not going out of business. It means they're merging and becoming parts of systems. So mergers and acquisitions is a common phrase, and it applies not just to healthcare, but to all businesses. And you'll you'll hear it, you'll hear it referred to merger, mergers and acquisitions or M and A, M and A. It sounds like M and A, but it's M and A as opposed to M and M, right? So Merger, a merger, the difference, right, is kind of semantic, but um, but it's interesting to know. A merger technically means that two organizations combine their assets, combine the business into a third organization. So that so let's say firms A and B decide they want to merge. Well, they merge and they create firm C, and then A and B cease, cease to exist as independent entities. An acquisition is where one firm buys the other firm, and the firm that's bought ceases to exist as an independent entity. So if A acquired B, then A continues and B ceases to exist as an independent entity. So here's an example of a relatively recent merger between uh, Elliott Hospital and Southern New Hampshire Healthcare. So Elliott Hospital, for those of you who are not from New Hampshire, is in Manchester. It's, it's the second or third largest hospital in the state. Uh, merged operations with Southern New Hampshire Health System, which is in Nashua. Uh, in order to gain some economies of scale, right? So they're going to try to um, streamline their business operations like HR and finance and then you know, marketing and so forth. And the, uh, But also they combine to negotiate with insurance companies. So this is, this is, this, they become a uh, solution health is the, is the new system. So these two merged and Elliot, and Southern New Hampshire cease to exist as separate entities and become uh, Solution Health, one entity. That's a merger. Uh, and so hospitals don't like to use the word mergers or acquisitions. They like to use the word affiliations, which sounds so much cuddlier and, and like lovey and not businesslike. But here's the thing, like healthcare is a super aggressive business and there really are mergers, of mergers and acquisitions going on and affiliations makes it sounds like we're just hanging out together. They're really not. They're either a merger or an acquisition. Um, 
Now, there are some affiliations where they are just kind of hanging out together, but that's not what these are. So here's some examples. North Country Healthcare, I mentioned before, one of the unique, uh, really unique systems in the country. It's three critical access hospitals. They merged into North Country Healthcare. So AVH, Upper Connecticut, and Weeks merged into form North Country. Granite One Health, also a merger, technically sort of a merger with Catholic and Catholic in, which is the other big hospital in Manchester, Huggins, which up is up in, uh, up by the, in the lakes region and Monadnock hospital, uh, in Peterborough. So these three were a merger nominally, at least Catholic is like 10 times bigger than either of the other two. Uh, but they merged into Granite One Health. Wentworth Douglas, on the other hand, has been acquired by Mass General or Mass General Brigham. And if you go by their hospital now, you'll can see they're starting to put new signs out saying that they're, you know, it's it's Mass General at at, at Dover or Mass General at Wentworth Douglas kind of uh things. Um Solution Health, again, a merger. Frisbee Hospital, which is a small hospital in Rochester, was acquired by HCA, which is a which is a national for-profit hospital chain. So they were acquired. That wasn't a merger. Um, they were acquired. LRG Healthcare was uh, a, cu a couple of small hospitals in um, uh, the Lakes region. They basically went bankrupt and got acquired by Concord Hospital. So they're now under Concord Hospital. Exeter hospital is in the process of basically selling itself to Beth Israel Deaconess Leahy system. So those are some examples. So when, when you hear healthcare organizations talking about affiliations, they usually mean mergers and acquisitions, or they mean an alliance. So, and this is why I don't like them using affiliations because you can't tell, is it, um, are they like formally becoming one entity or are they just kind of working together nicely? So um, so Mass General has a number of affiliations with hospitals in New Hampshire and Maine where they have basically a contractual relationship where Mass General might send providers up to provide uh, services that the local hospital is having a hard, you know, maybe couldn't provide on their own. So like maybe some sort of super specialist, like a pediatric neurology care or something like that. So they have an, an, an alliance where a mass general physician one day a week comes up to say, you know, um, Catholic medical center and sees pediatric neurology patients because Catholic doesn't have a big enough population to justify having a pediatric neurologist on staff. So, so that's not a situation where the organizations are, are merging into one organization. They're just agreeing to play nice together. Now, another variation that's like a merger and acquisition is a joint venture. And this is where two firms get together like, hey, we want to create this, this new entity, a third firm. Um, to provide some service that maybe the two of us can't do on our own or just, you know, we don't have the population in each of our spaces. So we'll set up a third thing and each of us will own half of it or whatever proportion they want. We're not merging our service. We're not merging our organizations. We're just creating this third entity that each of us is going to own a piece of. Um, and so all three firms remain legally separate entities in that case. And the first two firms just basically have shared ownership of the third firm. So that's a joint venture. And all this stuff applies not just to healthcare, but to any kind of business. And we're almost there, guys. Uh, types of integration. So there are different ways that mergers and acquisitions happen. Most of the mergers I was just talking about are sort of horizontal in integrations where it's the same kind of organization. So you might imagine like, let's say there are two shoe stores in town and one shoe store buys the other shoe, shoe store, right? And so now there are, you know, now there are two shoe stores, but they're owned by the same organization. So whether that's a merger or an acquisition, it doesn't matter. The point is they're they're providing the same uh, services. Uh, I've got I'm going to pause here because I've got a wee leaf blower outside. All right, hopefully that silences it a little bit. So in that case, why would you have you know, or or maybe it's not in town, but like 
there's a shoe store in Durham and a shoe store in Dover, right? And they and they want one sells to the other. Now now it's all one one organization. Why would they do that? Well, it's this it's that uh, goal of economies of scale, right? So if I'm if I'm now two shoe stores, I can get rid of the HR people from the other store. I can get rid of the finance people from the other store, and I can run HR and finance from one. But that's one way to get economies of scale. Another way to get economies of scale is I'm now buying, I'm now, when I contact the manufacturers and I want to place my orders, instead of ordering for one shoe store, I'm ordering for two shoe stores. And so I can place bigger orders. And so the manufacturers are likely to sell me their, their, their products at a lower price because I'm buying more of them. Well, this all applies to this to healthcare too. So when Elliot and Southern got together, yes, they were able to eliminate some redundant administrative support. That's all good. Not good for administrators like me, but it's all good for patients, right? So you can you can cut back on some administrative staff. But also when Elliot and Southern go to order medical supplies or pharmaceuticals, now they're ordering for two healthcare systems worth of patients instead of one healthcare system worth of patients. And again, they can get better discounts uh, because they're ordering in larger volumes. And so they're achieving an economy of scale that way. And finally, when they're bigger like that, they can also negotiate with insurance companies to get better reimbursement. So when the insurance company's like, hey, we're negotiating for our network and we want you to take $80 instead of $100, Elliot and Southern can say, we're like, you know, so big now and it's really hard for your patients to go someplace else. So instead of paying us 80 instead of 100, how about paying us 95, right? And the insurance company doesn't have as much leverage when the systems are bigger and the patients and they have fewer choices of where to direct their patients. So those are the advantages uh, of having a horizontal integration where you're basically Elliot and Southern are basically the same. They're the same level of care. They're secondary, maybe tertiary, a little bit of tertiary levels of care. So they're basically the same kinds of hospitals. They're in different places, but they're basically the same kind of hospitals. So, so they're merging together to get efficiencies in terms of like overhead costs. They can cut their overhead for administrative costs. They can buy their supplies at cheaper rates because they're ordering in larger volumes and they can negotiate better with the insurance companies. So those are the three elements that are beneficial to a horizontal merger. And this applies to any business. That's why I use like shoe stores, easy to understand. Now a vertical integration is when you buy, uh, when organizations merge and they have different roles in the chain of value. So for example, if Nike were to, so Nike makes shoes, right? And if Nike were to buy uh, DSW, the that the chain, it's, a, it's a, like a national chain of shoe stores. So Nike makes shoes, but it doesn't, except for a few outlet, stores, it doesn't really have like a big retail operation. It mostly sells its shoes to retailers who then sell the shoes for them, right? So they're a wholesaler who sells, who sell their wares to, to retailers. But if Nike was like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get into the retail business. And so they buy DSW and they turn it into the Nike shoe store. Now Nike makes shoes and they sell them at a retail level. So instead of selling, you know, so instead of just making the shoes and then selling the shoes to retailers and having retailers sell the shoes, now Nike makes the shoes and they sell them directly to consumers. So what they've done is they've integrated along the chain of value. They've, they've, in this case, they've, they've downward integrated, right? They've integrated down the chain. Um, so the goal is to try to capture more value in the chain. So an example is, is MGB, Mass General Brigham, acquiring Wentworth Douglas. Wentworth Douglas can't, doesn't have anywhere near the capabilities of, of MGB. MGBs are quaternary, tertiary and quaternary, you know, Mass General is a tertiary and quaternary hospital. Wentworth Douglas is a secondary, maybe, maybe a little bit of tertiary care, um, but primarily it's a secondary level of care right? It's, it's your strokes and your, you know, your knee replacements and stuff like that, but they're not doing 
you know, heart lung tr uh, transplants at Mass General, excuse me, at Wentworth Douglas. They are at Mass General. Um, so what are the benefits? So MGB, is, so in reality, what MGB needs is it wants to do the tertiary and the quaternary care. It doesn't really want to do a whole lot of, of primary and secondary care. It does do some, but it doesn't want a lot. What it really wants is for Wentworth Douglas to identify people that need tertiary and quaternary care and send those patients to MGB to get this higher level of care. So, so Wentworth Douglas sits at the secondary level, primary and secondary level. MGB primarily sits at the tertiary and quaternary level. And what MGB wants is to be able to, is to, to get all of Wentworth Douglas's sicker patients sent to them. So by acquiring Wentworth Douglas, it, it creates a funnel of patients into the MGB system. Now, what Wentworth Douglas gets is MGB has all these incredible specialists and incredible medical training. And so MGB can help improve the care that's given at Wentworth Douglas. Plus, it's a behemoth when it comes to finance. It's enormous. Um, it has it, you know billions and billions of dollars each year. Um, and so it lends Wentworth Douglas some financial strength uh, in a time when community hospitals are are going bankrupt. So, you know, um, so Exeter Hospital wanted to be part of Mass General a couple of years ago, and they were trying to merge with uh, merge. They wanted to merge Exeter Hospital, which is one town south of of or two towns south of Durham wanted to merge Exeter and Wentworth would merge together and then be one unit that was subordinate to MGB. Um, and what happened was the state attorney general's office said, if that happens, there won't be as much competition on the seacoast because now MGB will basically own two of the three biggest hospitals on the seacoast, Portsmouth, Regional is about the same size as Wentworth Douglas. Ro uh, uh, Frisbee in Rochester is pretty tiny, uh, not really a competitor. Um, and so what the attorney general was concerned about was competition. They want, they want, they don't want what, what regulators don't want is too many or excuse me, too few providers in a community because then they can jack up prices, right? If I'm the only, if I'm the only ED or I'm the only family practice doctor in, in the area, I can charge you more because where else are you going to go? There's nobody else. And so I can charge you more. Likewise, if when hospitals merge, there's lots of evidence that when hospitals merge in a community, they raise prices. So there's a real um, issue with what's called antitrust. And this applies to, this doesn't apply just to healthcare. This applies uh, across the board. So like Google has been accused of antitrust, Microsoft been accused of antitrust, Facebook, so on. And the idea here is any one or the market becomes highly concentrated, which means that there are just a handful of providers of whatever the services. In this case, we're talking about healthcare, but it could be search if you're Google, or it could be social media advertising if you're Facebook and so on. So market concentration basically means there's not very many, not very much uh, competition. And as a result, firms can get into what's called anti-competitive behavior, which basically means they start jacking up their prices um, uh, by, you know, by refusing to, uh, to compete. So the federal, so the two entities that really deal with antitrust are the Federal Trade Commission and the state attorney general. So what I said before was the state attorney general in each state manages, states vary. In New Hampshire, the state attorney general addresses these sorts of issues of mergers and acquisitions, and they study whether there are, whether there's sufficient competition in a particular industry or not, if, if two firms were to merge. And so in New Hampshire, they blocked the merger of Exeter and Wentworth Douglas in uh, as part of MGB because they basically they basically said they, that would eliminate competition on the seacoast. The Federal Trade Commission gets involved when, especially when there are are interstate um, 
arrangements. So in this case, Mass General Brigham is in is headquartered in Massachusetts. And Wentworth Douglas and Exeter are in in uh, New Hampshire, of course. And so now you're going across state lines. And so that's where the federal government can get involved under the constitution because the federal government uh, is authorized to regulate trade between the states. So the FTC or the Federal Trade Commission oversees uh, antitrust for firms that operate at a national level or at least an interstate level. And then the state attorney generals also monitor competitive uh, or anti-competitive behavior and make sure that customers are not being taken advantage of, citizens are not being taken advantage of by firms that are that have excess market power or you know are becoming either oligopolies where they're just a couple of firms or monopolies when there's just one. All right, that is it for uh, this chapter and we uh, and this will be all that's covered on uh, week three's exam.